Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Reimagined, streaming live on ThinkTech Hawaii. We're facing massive work disruptions due to automation and now the pandemic. Our challenge is to create solutions that address the future of work and demands of a new labor market. On Hawaii Reimagined, I feature innovators and entrepreneurs who are addressing these economic and workforce development issues with innovative solutions that will make a positive social impact for people in our communities. I'm Ruby Menon, your host. I help mid-career professionals navigate their career transition in my career Get It Done Mastermind community. And you can learn more at brainsmartdesign.com. So my guest today is Sheila Buyakakchar, the founder of an educational com company called Focused Reality. And what Focus Reality does and her and she and what she does is creates interactive project-based learning opportunities for students to develop the skills they need for the future of work and develop them into impact citizens who contribute to their communities. We'll talk about her work in education and also about the app she created called Mag Hugs that allows an educator to quickly create send and record customized messages about a student's positive actions and impact on others. Sheila, I am so happy that you're here. You've joined me to talk about your work in Focused Reality and especially about these project-based learning initiatives that you're working on in the education sector. So I wanna dive right in and uh, let's start with your, your story. Like how did you, you know, what's your career path and how did you get started uh, uh, in the education sector? And how did, what led you to create Focused Reality? Sure, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Ruby, for inviting me uh, to talk about some of my passion. Uh, it all got started when I graduated from college many moons ago when I wanted to teach kids about business. And I never did until I was retired from the US Air Force. And I came about uh, trying to teach them about business. And I found out that no one talked about entrepreneurship, no one talked about innovation, no one talked about passions and potential. And so I created something instead. And after I retired, um, I did some after school programs. I could not get into the schools because of No Child Left Behind. So all the extracurricular things went out the door, but I did get some after school programs and summer programs and was able to create this wonderful interactive um, way of learning about their community and about things that are created from ideas all the way to actually being a reality. And so therefore the, the words focused, so we focus in on a reality that they can uncover their potential, their passions and make connections to community in a very valuable way. So that's how it got started way back when. So let's focus in on um, focused reality, actually. <laughs> uh, uh, let, let's talk a little bit. Uh, I know that there's a lot of work being done with project-based learning. Uh, I think there's, um, oh, what's that, MTLS? What does that stand for? Um, um, most likely to succeed. succeed. Yeah. And they that film was pretty amazing. It was quite an eye opener in terms of how they're using project based learning as a modality to bring these kids into the 21st century. Yeah. Um, so it, it, is that a similar model that you're utilizing in your project based learning approach? Maybe you can talk a little bit about what's, you know, how, how are you doing that? And are you only working with the kids? Or are you working with the teachers? Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Okay. Um, well, what you, what you find out through research, as well as working with kids, or just being yourself, you tend to want to do things. Uh, you tend to want to play. So the more you can enjoy your work, the more it isn't work anymore. So uh, pro project-based learning came about for that very reason, is putting 
anyone into the real world situations where they can make decisions, uh, look at resources, and actually come up with things to solve a problem. Um, so Pro project-based learning has been around for a while. Uh, we just chose as an educational system to be more lecture focused. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're making those assumptions that everybody learns the same way. But as we all know, no one learns anything like each other. Everything, everybody is unique. And so project-based learning has always been a part of me even before I learned that this was great educational learning methodologies, pedagogical kinds of methods, um, just because it just made sense. And so uh, I've always used it because I've always wanted the kids to play and be exposed to community kinds of issues and problems and opportunities. Uh, so I think that's where it comes from and it gets rooted in the research. And so I was lucky enough to have research back up my gut feelings on how kids actually learn. And so now it's, it's entwined in everything, right? I use community centered projects where it's not just go do anything you want to, it's really about solving a problem within the community. And we try to focus their, their knowledge uh, um, exploration, we try to focus all of that so they can experience these potentially passionate things and strengths um, and see that they can master something that they never thought they could or create something that they never thought about before. So it's really kind of interesting. And so Sheila, um, now walk me through like an experience. So let's say if I was a student that was enrolled in the, uh, one of these programs, project-based learning, would I just come in and tell you, Sheila, I've got an idea that I want to work on something. I love animals and I want to do something with animals and I've got this project idea. Do, do I just run with it or, you know, like, is there some structure around it? Do I work with a teacher or a mentor? Could you kind of walk, walk us through like, what would that experience be like for a student? Sure. Um, all of the above. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, all of the above, but let me give you a scenario. So it depends on where you're coming in at. Uh, when I first started, it was really about just exposing the kids to what around them is really about ideas and getting it to market. And so that was an exploration of all these different kinds of things that were in the community. We looked at Harley Davidson motorcycle to the houses, to a neighborhood being built from nothing to actually the actual signs and the model house that holds all of those things that people create, design, manufacture, and sell. Um, so that was one phase. Now what's happening is it depends on what the teachers need. Since we're so focused on common core, there are things that teachers have to teach. And that is really critical. So we can come in at, or any teacher can come in and do, all right, you guys, let's talk about your passions and let's create something from nothing and you determine what you want that to be. She'll put criteria in there, like it has to have some value to the community. It has to solve some problem in the community and that is wide open. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you were thinking. I can just come in and that's the way it is. And I come up with it. We guide them to their passions or strengths or just knowledge in general um, or something more specific. And a lot of the schools are going down this road is they will create an inquiring or a big question about it. How do we or how do you sustain health in community? And so now it has to come community, health oriented, as well as in one specific teacher wanted to make sure that it could be a proposal for a science project. Mm -hmm. So now he's put in a special spin on that and now it has to be science focused. Mm -hmm. So you can put in all kinds of criteria if you wanna go, 
whatever you guys want to do, let's do it. They're going to go through the same process as if we give them a bounded piece to something that's wide open. They'll go through what's, what's the knowledge that you have? What's the knowledge out there? What are the ideas to solve this issue or problem or opportunity? And then how are we going to go about it? What's the product? What's the service? What are the issues that you're going to fulfill when you give that solution back? to that community member, organization, or teacher. So are we mostly, are you mostly working with high school students or what age group does this model fit the best with? I think, um, again, it depends on the teacher, depends on what you wanna do. When I first started, I had second graders to fifth grade and it was phenomenal. Oh. So it worked out well. I mean, the things that they came up with was phenomenal stuff. Like, um, like, like what kind of projects did they do? Um, one girl loved gymnastics. So she opened up a, in theory, she opened up a, a gymnastic shop. This was before, many years ago, 10, 15 years ago, before gymnastic shops were even part of the community service provider. Uh, one girl wanted to paint. So she sold one painting that was her market. It was an older man with a lot of money and her, all she wanted to do was sell one painting. So she came up with a painting. Um, so these were third, fourth, fifth graders. And then, but in this day and age, um, it's hard to get teachers to understand, to do these things because they have so many other things that they have to teach. Yeah. Although I personally believe it can be taught, it's very difficult to do that if you don't have the certain mindset. So it does take a certain pedagogical mindset. Mm -hmm. Now, I would say the best time to do it is middle school through high school in this kind of educational landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason is, is because community members really re relate best to that age group, to the teachers can see the products that can come out. And I think um, you can really reason with a middle schooler or a high schooler, instead of having them go hog wild, you can put boundaries around them, just like any business has resource constraints. Uh, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think, I believe in this landscape, your middle school to high school, I would love to do it from kindergarten on up. So it sounds to me, though, that uh, well, one of the things that they talked about in the most likely to succeed model was trying to convince the parents that this was a viable learning methodology uh, was very difficult because the parents were so wired into what they know, right, which is my kids have to go through the standard curriculum, they've got to pass their exam so that they can get into the best schools, right? And that's the narrative that everybody's been taught. Mm -hmm. That's the model. And now when you're trying to do something that's a little bit different, um, you've got the parents that you've got to convince. Probably the students are, are all well, probably the ones that are the most adaptable and want to try this. But you've got the parents and then I, I would think that you maybe also have the teachers because the teachers are so constrained within the educational system of you know what they've got to deliver so what type of um i guess friction or you know have ha, what how have you encountered any of the, uh, that type of friction and what have you done to overcome that in order to present this as a viable learning model so you've uh, pinpointed so many issues or uh, yeah, issues within our educational system, but not only in the educational system, within society itself. Mm -hmm. We are so bent on tests to get into the best schools. I have to perform on a test. I have to get good grades. I also have to perform not only throughout my school to get a GPA of 4.0 or 5.0. I also have to perform on all these other batteries of academic intelligence. But as we all know, when we get into the workplace, there are many, many ways that we are 
able to give our strength and to be part of a team that is really essential for business and for communities to, to sustain itself. So, so you have an issue of that whole societal testing requirement. But what has happened is research has proven that if you can create this rigorous project that sustains over time, that allows kids to read, write, explore, research, uh, do experiments, be, come up with creative ideas to solve problems, decision making, and constrain their resources, and then present it to a community of partners or just to parents, they have found that this type of learning is the kids tend to perform better than the academic ones mm -hmm. that are only with lecture. Now, we're talking about in general, right? There's always going to be some that's always going to be very high scoring uh, students, but there's, but that's probably outliers, right? The majority is in the middle. Mm -hmm. And when I don't get the A or the B, you're talking about confidence. You're talking about, I don't know what my passion is because I'm not good at math or science but I'm good at drawing, but that's not, that doesn't have value when I take a, uh, a test. So what we're finding and through the most likely to succeed type of campaigns or awarenesses is that we can do it. We can do it all. We can have science and, and math classes in regards to methodologies, but to really apply what we learn within these subjects we need to practice and we need to do and we need to be creative and innovative. And when you do that, the depth of learning is huge compared to, I'm just going to remember this equation. And once I take the SAT, I'm a done deal. Mm -hmm. right? So the depth is, is the, of the learning is so incredible that we're finding more teachers willing to take that chance oh. it's not an easy road to to go down yeah. but the rewards are phenomenal exciting and, and innovative it's just exciting to see these kids create products that they never knew about when they came into the project and then they're actually uh teaching others to do these things yeah so it's really exciting it's an exciting time as well. Well, you know, I'm um, I'm reading a phenomenal book right now called The Adaptive, Ad Adaptability Advantage. It was written by Heather McGowan, who is a futurist. And um, they're really talking about what, how are humans, how are we as humans going to thrive in this 21st, what they call the fourth industrial revolution uh, with automation coming in where we're probably most likely going to be working and we are right now working side by side with robots or some type of bot like type of technology. And how are we going to 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 do this and it has to start, I think, and she rightly says so in her book as well that it has to start at at a young age with education and teaching these types of skill sets to students because we are going to have to be continuous learners. And that's the one thing that unfortunately we're still in the manufacturing age educational process where we're, you know, the, the days of you will learn one subject and you have the same job for 40 years and then you retire with your gold watch or them days are over. And chances are in the fourth industrial revolution, <laughs> you know, you're probably going to have five or six different types of jobs and you're going to have to like rapidly learn on the fly. And it sounds to me like that's what this model is really set up to do is to try to give these kids the skill sets to be able to go in and be creative and adaptable and flexible. And uh, because we only have a few minutes, we have about 10 minutes left. I want to make sure that we talk about mag hugs, which is, uh, uh, I'm just really um, excited about this app that you're doing because it's hitting on something that I think is um, really difficult to reinforce. So 
I'll stop yapping and I'll have you talk about like what is Mag Hugs and what are you trying to do with that app in order to change behavior? Sure. Uh, one of the key pieces, um, if you don't mind putting up the, the PEVA slide, the bowl, I'll go through that really quick man, and answer some of the things you asked about in the previous thing. So if you look at this um, and you start at the bottom, what happens is to be able to be innovative, creative, and, and use some of your strengths and passions, which is at the top of the bowl, you have to start off with connection and a sense of belonging, and you have to have some sort of skills and knowledge, okay? And the only way that you can get that is by creating an atmosphere of connection, ignition, and inspiration, okay? So if you don't do this, what happens is you'll go back into the educational landscape that we are in, and you'll wait for the answers and take the test and know nothing else. Mm -hmm. So as we educate our students, we really need to have that middle role, connection, belonging, and skills. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about mag hugs, mag hugs is that connection and the sense of belonging piece. Mm -hmm. It really takes a look at that bottom part that is essential to any kind of learning. If you have no connection to anyone, you have no connection to knowledge no connection to, to love or anything that is human. Mm -hmm. So therefore you need that. And mag hugs is about mindful, accepting and giving hugs where a student can really feel that, oh my God, I, I value, I have some sort of value to this person that's telling me that I I did something, I had impact on somebody else. And also I'm able to go, I am helpful and no one can take that away. So mag hugs really hits home on the bottom foundational piece of social emotional knowledge, skills, and attempts to bring that student together with another person by impacting through their behavior on someone else. In other words, I'll give you a hug. So how does it, how does it work then? How, how does that sure. happen? So, so perfect. Ruby, you invited me here onto this show so I could really share about mag hugs and focused reality so other people could really understand the educational landscape and maybe what our kids really need. That is really helpful. That is so helpful, way to go. So that is a hug. It tells Ruby, you did something that impacted me and your viewers. And in a way that you are helpful and you are giving of your time and your knowledge. Now, you how, can, how, how was that message delivered? That, de that message is delivered from teacher to child via and either a text message or an email, or if that child doesn't have any kind of technology, he or she gets a note sent home with him or her or a phone call. Oh, wow. So is it like a just in time type of uh, immediate feedback or is it done like at the end of the day? Like how does, because it's from teacher to student, right? So the teacher right. is observing the behavior and then providing some type of feedback, positive feedback to reinforce the behavior to the, to the child, the, the student. Yes. Um, so how, how do the teachers use it? So the teachers would use it, could be immediate, right? Uh -huh. Or it could be after the fact, or it could be during a report or a conference, right? A parent-child conference. Mm -hmm. We would hope that it would be immediate if possible, or right mm -hmm. after class. So it could be sent out to the child and or the parent and, and the parent. Mm. So it's one of those things. It depends on how you can use it. We would like it immediate because it immediately gives a frontal lobe hit mm. or a hit to the frontal to mm. say, oh, I was helpful. Oh, I did invite her on. And my viewers are really now becoming aware of some of the issues within our school. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we want that, especially because if you look at connection, belonging, mm -hmm. that's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. It's giving value to someone else. So are teachers using this, uh, uh, the Mag Hugs app now? Do you have that in teachers' hands? And what's, what's their, how, how are they adapting to it? Well, we went through this summer, we went through some manual processes trying to make sure that the teachers would even use it or thought it was helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, we got some thumbs up from some teachers. It is still in prototype right now. I'm hoping to take it to a software developer and trying to get it into a more of an application mm -hmm. where the teachers can actually use it and see if, if they're, although it might be a great idea, mm -hmm. are they going to use it? And that's always something that we have to deal with. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Because <laughs> we've been talking about positive enforcement for, I don't know, how many years? 50, mm -hmm. 50 years? <laughs> Um, and so it's not a very easy thing to do because what we tend to focus on some of the negative, it's easier uh, yeah. to do that, a lot easier. But um, I think it's because we've learned that versus trying to relearn how to focus on the impact a student can have on others around them. Yeah, I, and I think that, I mean, uh, you know, we've been, uh, working with software development projects for a while and we know how difficult adoption of a new product is and so much of it is uh, based on training the user to use it on a regular basis and so that hurdle you know like how do you train the teachers to remember to take the phone out of their pocket and actually start to text you know when they observed you know little mary over there doing something really cool um, so that's going to be the challenge, I guess, and you know they probably will get a lot, a lot of user feedback as you get that app into their hands. Um, but the whole concept sounds pretty cool because uh, behaviors are probably the most difficult. You know, to you, you can't, um, you know, like on a test score, it's either black or white. Either you pass the test or you didn't. You know, it's very easy to quantify. But when you're doing behaviors they've got that there's a lot of research about how they have to be uh, re reinforced and rewarded immediately. Mm -hmm. I hate to bring up the example of a dog, but you know, that's how we do dog training, right? I mean, <laughs> if you if you give uh, Fido a dog biscuit 30 minutes later, they're going to go, oh, thanks, thanks for that. But they're not going to connect that to the behavior that, you know, and so a lot of it is that immediate instant feedback that I think is gonna be so valuable. So rooting for mag hugs, cause I think it's an incredible concept. And I think that I don't think I, there's anything quite like it that I've heard of anyway in the school system. I haven't heard of anything like it. And I think the thing about mag hugs is even if you, so I agree with you, immediate would be wonderful. But mm -hmm. even if you forget, what, what Mag Hugs did do this summer is it really helped teachers to change the way they look at students. Yeah. So when I was asking them, what was the behavior? They're like, okay, uh, I'm not sure. I don't know what he did, but you have to find a behavior for him. Oh, right. okay. So they switched their lenses and started talking about the behavior. Oh, he opened the door for Donna so she didn't have to put down her books. Oh my God, that was helpful. They never noticed a person opening up the door for Donna that always came in with a big bag of books or, you know, no yeah. one noticed those kinds of things. So yeah. it starts to model and help them, even if they never do mag hugs, they're still sending hugs okay. to their students. And that's the real goal, hidden goal of mine. That yeah. I want you to use mag hugs because you're going to learn and you're going to teach the kids. Oh, she's watching that. Oh, I've never realized I was that helpful or that valuable or I belong or I connect. Um, yeah. I want them to use it. So we're going to have to, on that note, we're going to have to, unfortunately we've run out of time. I could talk to you for probably another three hours about this topic, Sheila. Um, yes, me too. So uh, I just wanted to remind everyone, I'm Ruby Menon and this is Hawaii Reimagine on Think Tech Hawaii. And Sheila, how can people find out more? Is there a website they can go to sure find can. out more? Yes, 
it's focused with an ed reality.com awesome so focused reality.com thank you so much sheila for your time and for your amazing work in education we need more people like you in the education sector and thank you all for being here and please check back on our next show which will be on wednesday december 16th at 3 p.m I'll be talking to Yvette Ellis from Charger Help, an innovative startup that's based in Los Angeles that is building an app and training people to provide on-demand repair of electrical vehicle charging stations. So until next time, please be safe and be kind to one another. Aloha.